Janet Mason of the League of Women Voters. I'm pinch hitting for uh, Chair Foley, who is excused today. And I'm also pinch hitting for Robert Harris, the Vice Chair, who will be giving uh, the bulk of the presentation on ethics reform today. Let's start with uh, approval of the, and noting that there is a quorum present. There are five members present. Let's start with the uh, approval of minutes from the October 19th meeting. And I'm reminding people that the minutes we're voting on are those that were distributed this morning, which include corrections from Robert Harris and Commissioner Maramoto. May I have a motion? I move. I'll second. Okay. All in favor, raise your hands, please. All right, it's unanimous. Excellent. Next, we have testimony, public testimony. We received written testimony from five people Jim Schoen, Lynn Madriso, the Department of Land and Re um, Natural Resources, Gary Hoover, and Inga Gibson. Um, are any of you present? Let's see. Uh, Lynn? Good afternoon, yeah. Lynn. I'm here. I'd like to point out some things in my testimony and then some additions based on testimony sent in by Gary Kuzu, Inga Gibson, and Jim Schoen. Um, I'm really concerned with using Kanalua. It's as a Shabai. It's not in the Roberts Rules or any other really parliamentary things. It's a cop out. You either vote yes or you vote no or you abstain. But you don't vote Kanalua and then have it count as a yes vote. The city council did it years ago and there was an outcry, so they finally got that out of their rules. Uh, I'm also concerned that if a quorum is required for any vote and it cannot be achieved due to recusals based on conflict of interest, the members that, that you know, are recused will be allowed to participate. That is totally not right, especially if you have a bunch of them at the same time saying that they're recusing themselves. Uh, on a lobbyist disclosure bill, it's common knowledge that lobbyists draft bills. This bill should be amended to include identifying bills, resolutions, or administrative actions, which the person or the person's client drafted so the public knows exactly who's behind the bill. Um, I don't understand why when you were talking about County Government Structure Review, you omitted the former Kauai County Council member who was sentenced in federal court this past May to 20 years in federal prison for drug trafficking, assault of a federal law enforcement officer, witness and evidence tampering, tampering and firearm offenses. And again, it seems that the feds always win. All, all these cases get taken up in, in federal court. Um, and I don't understand why there is no appropriation for Honolulu in the county ethics unless they have one, and I'm unaware of it. I, I'd like to concur with Jim Schoen's comments that leadership will kill a bill with multiple deferrals. Recently, the outgoing speaker of the Arizona House of Representatives, a Republican, said there was one bill that was so bad that he actually referred it to 12 committees to kill it. So evidently, this is a common practice throughout the United States. Um, I also agree with comments about no defective dates, that non-fiscal bills will not be referred to WAM and finance, that bills shouldn't die in conference committee because a chair or a member is absent, and with the testimony submitted by Inga Gibson. A lot of these items were covered in previous meetings, so my hope is that they will be in, in something coming out in the next meeting or two. But these are really important to the public. Thank you. And I'd like to thank um, Janet Mason for properly pronouncing my last name. Uh -huh. All right. Any questions, commissioners, for Lynn? Go, go ahead, Senator. Um, Lynn, um, this is uh, Representative Marmoto, former Representative Marmoto. Um, you have objections to the um, reservations vote? The yeah, I do. Um, you you have to vote, and you shouldn't be allowed to vote if you don't. It's not Find another way 
to get a quorum so the person who has that is a yes vote however it, um, it shouldn't count as a yes vote it should count as the point is just like with Kanalua, you do Kanalua, and, and then it counts as a yes vote there's no such thing in parliamentary procedure for somebody saying hello and then that counts as a yes so it's not so parliamentary yes procedure so is this just in hawaii that we use this or uh, is it used well, in I don't other think, legislative I, 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 bodies I, I think that there should be no kind of law, period. That that's a Hawaii thing. It's a Hawaii thing. Yeah, I mean, that's, I don't know any other I always state. Found it, no, I found it useful sure. because I'd be uh, for a bill, but there might be one provision that uh, I would have a problem with. And it would give me an opportunity to stand up and express my reservations on, on the single point or points. So um, I, cannot, I think it's I a useful tool. And it is a yes vote. But it shouldn't be a yes vote. It should be a yes vote or a no vote, and there should be no kind of Lua vote. And, and the it, public looks at it differently than the way you look at it. That's the only way I can describe it. That, that could well be. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Robert? Lynn, thank you so much for the um, wonderful comments, very thorough, and I appreciate the time you take to um, look through everything. <laughs> I did want to uh, ask if you'd had a chance to look at, and I recognize there are a lot of attachments, uh, it is in the agenda uh, subsection J, which is the public bill of rights, which is taken largely from Jin Shan's earlier testimony, okay. which does include a number of different things, including, um, uh, I, I will just loosely uh, just summarize, um, the right to be treated with respect, um, the right to uh, not have retribution for testimony and other things stated, the right to provide oral testimony at any public hearing, the right to public inspect written testimony no later than 24 hours after it's submitted, um, the right to have access sufficient time to review all bill drafts, the right to expect that the content of the bill is not going to be suddenly and substantially changed without a public hearing, I expect that legislators will have an open, honest, have enough time to have an open, honest debate in the merits of a bill. The right that um, we it, bills will not be moved forward without with deliberate defects. Mm -hmm. The right to expect that um, standing committees of primary jurisdiction over fiscal matters are not referred bills solely for non-fiscal matters. Um, the right to expect that no bills shall die in conference committee due to right. Anyway, which is the point being is there is some of that captured potentially. I just want to make sure that that language is being reviewed with an opportunity if there are changes, uh, thoughts, et cetera, that you know, it's kind of a good opportunity to try to catch it there. And part of the reason why this is being proposed as a statute is hopefully to have a little bit more um, uh, grounding perhaps than just a rule change, which can be changed at any time. Yeah, no, I, I went through all of them on Sunday. Thank you for getting this up over the weekend so I had time to thoroughly go over everything. Okay, and, thank you. And, and, and write the testimony. But I, I did go through and I and I said I support the draft bill of rights. I just didn't bring that up today. I was focusing on certain areas. Okay, thank, thank you. If Again, if you have thanks. feedback, um, I think that's one that maybe you could continue to use some revising and tweaking. We have a little bit more time on it. Okay, will do. Thank you. Um, Gary Hooser reported to us that he would not be able to provide oral testimony, but I believe Inga Gibson is interested in uh, testifying. Inga? Yes, hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, Mike Hucko, thank you for the opportunity. And thank you so much for all of the, the work of the commission and the comprehensive drafts and proposals that have um, been uh, put forward. Um, I have not had the opportunity to review them all, but I really appreciate the work. Um, I did submit written testimony um, on behalf of myself, uh, Kat Brady, who I'm not sure if she can join, and Gary Fisher. Um, we have all been in discussions, and I think it's you know very interesting um, with Lynn's comments and former Rep. Sean's comments and others that these there are definitely um, a lot of the same themes, a lot of the same issues that continue to come up that you know really are driven by uh, the community and, and the public's desire for transparency and accountability. Um, without going over my written testimony, I did just want to mention a few things. I think we, we tried to prioritize them. We didn't go into great detail because we know that there's ongoing discussions, but um, the hearing process and the um, 
the determination whether or not to hear a bill in committee, I think we all agree is really a priority. And this really gets to the concentration of power um, that we have among just a few individuals. And this is, you know, one of the things that the public has brought to me, um, um, my advocates, you know, about the frustration with the committee hearing process. So uh, we try to think of um, a way that giving some power back to the people, um, because we know that the current process where um, uh, members of a committee could appeal, um, we know from uh, Representative Bellotti's uh, prior testimony that that is not something that I believe has happened for years, if, if ever. So um, by creating a process where the chairs would have to disclose those bills that they are not going to consider, they intend to defer or not consider, um, you know, setting those up for an opportunity for a hearing before deadlines where the public can kind of make their case, I think is really um, a, a prime kind of example of um, open government and, um, you know, um, power to the people to make sure that their voices are heard. Um, the second point that we noted um, in our testimony was the importance of open and public discussion in all committee hearings and voting in all committee hearings. Um, many of you know that it's you know quite common for a chair to just defer a measure without even taking a vote um, and without any discussion because all these decisions have been made prior to the committee ever even convening. I did have a chance to look at the conflict of interest um, language that was proposed um, for the rules, um, both the House and the Senate. And um, I, I won't speak on behalf of Kat and Gary here, but um, I strongly support that proposal um, and would just hope that um, some of the other areas of rules would, would also be amended the way that that conflict of interest section is. Um, for example, um, the standards of conduct um, that are within both the House and Senate rules. Um, I really feel that there needs to be a commission or a body or a neutral party that can address, investigate um, potential violations. Thank you, Robert, for uh, reminding us about that pending Bill of Rights that attempts to address that. Um, I did look into, you know, the Ombudsman, um, Office of the Ombudsman right now does not um, handle state legislative issues. That's only at the county level. So there is not a current body that would investigate potential violations or, you know, any members of the public that feel like there is misconduct. So I think that that's important. I don't want to suggest, Robert, that that would go to the Ethics Commission or the Civil Rights Commission, but I think there needs to be a body to investigate because we really can't expect the, the legislature to investigate themselves. Um, one, uh, two more uh, final comments uh, regarding the conference uh, committee process. As Lynn mentioned earlier, the concern I know um, is addressed in the Bill of Rights with conflicts of interest, that that's not going to re you know um, require a quorum because somebody isn't able to vote. However, in the, in the rules that are posted 2022 conference committee proceedings, um, you know, it, it only states that, you know, non-chairs, co-managers shall attempt or make every attempt to attend the hearings. But we all know that not attending, it, you know, is just a way to kill a measure. So I think that that needs to be re-examined so that, you know, one or two co-managers not attending does result in, you know, a bill dying in its 11th hour just because someone didn't attend for whatever reason. And then finally, um, not as important, it seems very manini, but um, this was my 15th year, uh, 15th session working in Hawaii, but I've also worked um, lobbying in Washington and Idaho and Oregon. And these other states require that lobbyists wear identification. And it seems, again, really simple, but I think it's really important because, um, you know, these folks, myself included, are at the legislature. Um, the public doesn't know who we are, who we represent. Um, I think it's a great way of identifying, um, you know, who these lobbyists are. And with that, and with all these additional changes that are being proposed, most states do um, rightfully um, expect some kind of fee to offset the administrative costs. Um, uh, the other states, I mean, it ranges from $25 to $100, and obviously there can be reduced rates for nonprofits or whatnot. But um, I think that would go a long way just, you know, again, with the advocates I work with not knowing who's who, um, I think it, it just adds to it, if nothing else, the appearance of more transparency because people actually have identification. So thank you so much for all your work and I look forward to continued discussions.
Inga, we really appreciate your comments. Thanks a lot. Any questions for her, commissioners? I have a brief question. Um, it's actually uh, regarding your last point about the wearing of identification by a lobbyist. Would this, would this apply to any community advocate who, who registers as a lobbyist, or including you know, nonprofit employees who may weigh in on particular resolutions, measures, and even budget items? Are we talking about uh, individuals who receive a substantial, if not all, of their uh, income or remuneration um, for lobbying activities uh, for that purpose? Would it be broad? How was it done in other states? Because I did advocacy in, in California, and you know, people generally knew who, they, who people were. Right, if you're around often, you do, but I don't think um, you know, those who aren't up there very often do. Um, so, uh, great question. And um, if anybody who would, who would be subject to the existing lobbying registration requirements would um, be required to wear, wear ID. So obviously, if those who are uh, uh, lobbying less than, I, sorry, Robert, uh, five hours a month or, <laughs> or during a session or whatnot, um, those folks wouldn't have to. Um, wear identification, but basically anybody that, that is required to register and submit disclosures would need to have identification. Um, other states, uh, which have been helpful, is uh, state um, uh, lobbyists or, you know, agency lobbyists, obviously, you know, representatives from DLNR or DOA or whatever state agency, you know, they're all required to wear their ID um, when they're at the Capitol. And, um, and then uh, in the case of Idaho, I represented I lobby for a nonprofit organization. So I had a green ID and then okay. the state agencies had a red ID so it can be color coded. Oh, um, you know, there, uh, it doesn't have to be that way, but I think um, all state, all, all those state agents, um, staff that are lobbying um, on behalf of an agency, some of them wear their ID, some don't. They probably, you know, should always wear ID. And then again, just, you know, so if somebody's coming up to the Capitol just to testify, you know, one time if they wouldn't normally have to register as a lobbyist, then I wouldn't expect them to get identification. But for those of us that are registered as required by law, then I think it's really easy to say you need to get, you know, an identification and it can be color coded according to whatever category um, the commission might deem best. Can I ask a quick question? Um, I believe uh, Commissioner Har Harris has a quick question. I'll Inga, great to see you again. Uh, a, one other idea that I've heard in this vein that may not require legislative change, I just wanted your quick thoughts on, would be is perhaps as a part of the uh, lobbyist registration requirements, getting a photograph and then posting that online so those photographs would be available with the lobbyist disclosures, which are currently all public. Um, would that be an intermediate step that might help sort of go part of the way there? Yes, that would be helpful. Um, uh, I, I don't know. Um, well, or either that, I mean, you could require that they also get identification. Um, to me, a, a photograph on the website without ID just means that anybody who wonders who is this senator spending hours and hours every day with would have to go to the website and identify them by photograph versus just being able to see their their name on their lapel. But it's better than nothing. <laughs> Okay, thank but I you. think it, we don't need legislation. I think if it is a requirement of the commission that when you register, re-register, that you um, that you need to get an identification. I think there would be challenges mm -hmm. with the commission trying to enforce mm -hmm. wearing of the ID without maybe some broader changes to the current law. So, you know, that that would require probably more buy-in from the sheriffs and others that would have to help enforce that, for example. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to testify? Yes, would you please identify yourself? Sorry, I can't read your identification. Thank you, are you talking to me? I'm not sure yes, I can't see. Yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, I'm, my name is Russell Ruderman. I'm uh, oh, putting it from the Big Island. I'm a, former state senator. And let me start off with a couple of apologies. Uh, I should have 
provided written testimony and I should have kept up with your process before now. So I'm very late to the table and I'm just gonna speak verbally if, if you folks will indulge me and I haven't read the relevant documents, I apologize. But I do thank you folks for all the work that you're doing. I just think that it's, uh, I, I'd like to touch on a few specific areas, but first let me say, I just think it's so important because you know we all know of the scandals that happened in the last couple of years and that at least there's some attention on this now and some expectation of some change and and you folks's recommendation will be taken so seriously as an official voice of, of what's being recommended and so i just uh, thank you for it and i urge you to be as bold as you can in the recommendations because um, of course they'll be watered down anyway but more importantly the issues facing us are, are, in my opinion, very urgent. And the system that the legislature operates on now is shockingly inefficient and ineffective in terms of serving the needs of regular people. And so, it, so it's a very urgent situation. I think that anything that gets put off a year or two probably won't happen because, you know, we're at the peak of perhaps, I hope, of consciousness of the need for this change. So. I encourage you to recommend as bold changes as possible. And thank you for indulging me once again. I do think that um, in terms of conflict of interest, I, I hope that there's attention paid to outside sources of income, especially where it comes to people who have consultancy type firms or consultancy type income, and that money is funneled through that kind of entity that doesn't show up in any campaign report and, and, and no one knows about it. And, and when those people spending money to that legislature come before the legislature, I think that's a pretty big conflict of interest and it needs to be disclosed. It's never disclosed in the course of things right now, never. It should be disclosed I think that anyone who has any financial interest in the legislation before us should recuse themselves, should explain it and recuse themselves. I know that's the rule now, but it's not the practice. Um, I'd also like to advocate for, for public financing. I think that it, you know, the, the, one of the problems is the the, le the legislators are so entrenched, you know, it's, incumbents never lose. They never lose. You have to do something really, really bad to lose. You know, so to give anyone a fair chance, I think we ought to go down the road of public financing. Um, and in terms of where the money comes from, I, I don't have the solution, but I think it should not be made complicated because Let's say we provided five million bucks a year for, per cycle for public financing. That would be less than a, ten, a tenth of one percent of our state budget. You know, it's let's just appropriate the funds without games or or, or, or strings attached. Just appropriate some funds for it. That would help. You know, scores of candidates, and it still wouldn't level the playing field, but it would give other people a fighting chance. Um, so I really believe in that. And we're on the subject of financing. I do think that you know, we, we should ban any kind of donations during session, not just fundraising, but donations. It should be at least two weeks before and two weeks after. And it, this doesn't hurt anybody. As I just mentioned, incumbents never lose their election. They don't, they don't need this money, you know? And, and they have all the rest of the year to get it anyway, you know? So I think that's, those two things together of controlling fundraising, conflicts of interest and in public financing will go a long way towards, uh, towards uh, making it a more fair playing field. I, would I hope we'll do some form of uh, advocacy for a sunshine law. I enjoyed the no sunshine law when I was in the legislature. It's nice to be able to meet and talk. I couldn't have really don't know how to have done without it. So I know some of the reasons why, but I think the benefits greatly outweigh, you know, what we might lose if we had sunshine law in the legislature. You could have exceptions as needed. I think obviously there would need to be exceptions for organization and stuff like that. 
But all the discussions that need to happen could happen in the open, open meetings, you know, with the public listening and hearing it. It's not that outrageous of a thing to ask that our democracy function in front of us. It's not that much to ask. One of the reasons that I think this is so important is something that I saw happen the last two years that I was there, and I know it's happened since. It's, it's just such a perversion of democracy that I've never gotten over it, honestly. Um, let's say there's a powerful chair, and he communicates to his or her caucus that if you don't go along with my package, A, B, C, and D, all of your bills are going to die. They're unrelated bills, unrelated financing. The A, B, C, and D are, in many cases, ridiculous and many cases to be vetoed later because they're ridiculous, but still the whole caucus is blackmailed by this, by, this, by this pronouncement. Now, of course, that chair could still do that without, you know, a, a, they could skirt the Sunshine Law, but at least they'd be breaking the law when they did that, and that would be something. I just think that this is an example of the way things are done there is an example of how it's a bully-based, coercion-based system that is not serving the public interest. I gave up being there because there's no chance for an honest legislator to, to work there. There's no chance. You have to sell your soul and your ethics. It's too high a price for me. But I ask you to think about what a big toll in our democracy that that's the reality that we have. So none of these things alone will fix the way people act there, but we need to make bold steps because I think it's so urgent. Um, that's about it for me. I'm, I'm sorry I haven't been more useful during your process or more interest, more available during your process. I'd love to answer any questions, of course, you have, and I wish I had all this in front of you on paper instead of just me talking, but please accept it as the best I can do right now. I thank you for your work and mahalo for listening. Thank you, Senator Ruderman. Certainly appreciate the time you're giving us and your valuable service in the past. Do, do any commissioners have questions for Russell Ruderman? I have a comment and a question. Uh, thank you very much for, for uh, attending our hearing today and for providing your uh, valuable feedback and the, the wealth of your personal experience and you know, when you make a statement like there's no chance for an honest legislator to work here in the building, that, that really hits at home as to why, in fact, we're here. Um, and we hope that, one, that's not the case, and two, that if it is the case, then we can move along the road to where it isn't the case. Um, with respect to uh, financial disclosures, what are your thoughts of, and, and consultancy contracts, or even in, in terms of, you know, members who may be partners of, of firms that receive, you know, judgments that come from public coffers due to, you know, malfeasance on the part of a government entity? Do you think that that legislator's share of such a judgment as a partner in a firm or whether it's a consultancy firm or a legal firm be disclosed? Yes, uh, I'm not sure if I understood every part of it, your question, but thank you, by the way. And um, yes, I think there should be more disclosure regarding that. I mean, it's as simple as can be, but if, an entity that's sending you money, whether there's an intermediary or not, is appearing before us, the legislature, then that should be disclosed, in my opinion. I didn't quite get the part you said about through public financing, but, I, but in terms of consultancy, I mentioned that because that's where a lot of the dirty business is going on nonstop and has been all along. And when someone's getting more money from a corporation through their consultancy fees than they are as a legislator, which I've seen happen. Then that's just, and then that 
that corporation comes before that, that legislator. I mean, it's outrageous. And yet, it's happening every year over and over. I think that's a, a pretty big deal. I mean, the guys that got caught with cash, they were just more careless than most of the other people running the show. And those that are more careful are doing things like this. Let me run by a quick scenario here. Say, say a, a legislator is a, is a partner in a legal services firm that wins a, a judgment in an environmental case against a state agency. Um, I've seen it that the legislature will appropriate money in the budget to pay off that judgment. Um, do you think it would be prudent for a legislator with that firm to to report the amount that they can be that they can expect to receive from that judgment? Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, sometimes you're talking about something that isn't known in advance. Whether you, but yes, that you're way ahead of me in your thinking that that kind of thing should be disclosed, and we sh and we should recuse ourselves in any related bill or committee discussion, in my opinion. Uh, when you have such a direct financial interest before the entity, in the entity that's before us. Thank you. Thank you. Barbara? Um, I think it was Dr. Ruderman, was it not? <laughs> uh, no, thank, thank you very much, but it's just a former, it's just Russell, to be honest. Former Senator Ruderman. I don't have a doctor. Well, I wanted My to, other life is in business. I wanted to thank you for your help with uh, the issue of sepsis that former Senator Fred Rolfing wanted to publicize. Do you recall? He was trying to I get do. a bill passed. It's been passed. a few years. Yeah, thank you. Well, I'm glad I, if I helped at all, I, I'm very, I'm very well, glad. Well, you served on the committee, um, yeah. and it was a, a, a futile. Uh, lobbying effort, but uh, um, well, I'm, a, I'm so disheartened by, by your uh, comment that, you know, there's no honest people around in the legislature. Okay. I think you were... I, I need to, and I'm I, sorry. I need to correct that. I didn't mean that there's no honest people there. I meant that an honest legislator doesn't have a chance to succeed with the honest legislative agenda that he was sent there with by his district. I didn't mean there's no honest ones there. Please forgive me. Well, yeah, but okay. not in not in not succeeding. You you did kind of mention there was bullies and those who were bullied. So, uh, you know, I I like to think that I you know I tried to be um, honest and turn the corner square. But um, you know, you <laughs> it was a little disheartening. I was thinking why pass the rules? But you know, this is the reason why we do need rules. Thank you for your encouragement to be bold. Uh, we'll remember that when we go through our deliberations. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right, I believe um, there's a representative from the Department of Land and Natural Resources, Pruitt. Do you have testimony for us? And could you please provide your last name? I'm sorry, I can't see it. Oh, it's Pua Ayu. I'm here representing the Department of Land and Natural Resources. We thank submitted you. written testimony, so I won't add to that. I just want to note that we're not against transparency, but it's a really a staffing issue. Um, we have one secretary for our board meetings, which are long and complicated, which is probably why people don't want to um, listen to the whole thing. Um, and it's very, very difficult for them to keep up with their work. We have meetings, two meetings every month. Um, and we have a hard time hiring when that position goes vacant. Uh, in the past, when we had much simpler minutes, we had a secretary and two clerks so that it was a lot easier to do. So we have been opposed to the measure on um, public meetings. And I'm, you guys take all your testimony up front, right? So I'm in the right place. Yes, yes you um, are. So, um, so this is testimony in relation to public meetings only, not, not to the bulk of your agenda. And um, so we are opposed to that bill, and it looks like it hasn't changed that much since it was uh, presented in the legislature last year. And thank you for reading all of the testimony. I did read the report and noted that you had read all of our testimony, as well as other agencies who also opposed it, sort of for the same reasons as us. And then 
lastly, um, we know that the, at the last meeting, you took up the public records bill, which we had also opposed, um, but I think you voted on that already. So that's the bulk of my testimony. Mostly I wanted uh, to make sure you guys knew I was here if you had any questions. Thank you very much for all of your work. Any questions, commissioners? All right, thank you for coming to testify. All right, I think that concludes our testimony for today. We have uh, nine uh, measures plus a set of proposed rule changes to consider. So um, let's, let's get going. Um, Robert, you're going to start with uh, the first proposed bill, right? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, just as a foremost matter, I'd like to um, thank everybody who submitted testimony through this proceeding. Uh, a lot of the ideas captured here do come from a lot of the public testimony, and I'll try to highlight that. I'd also like to thank the hard work of both uh, my staff at the Ethics Commission. Um, we have a professional fellow uh, who have assisted in a lot of the drafting, and then finally the House Majority staff and Casey Hines have been very invaluable in helping doing a lot of work to try to prepare the drafts you have in front of you. And I just, I do really want to highlight and thank them for all their work as well. Um, the first bill is one that you have seen a draft of before, which is specifically addressed to nepotism. Uh, currently, nepotism is addressed under the fair treatment law of the uh, Code of Ethics. Um, however, that sometimes has gaps. And I think the intent here is to create a bright line that is relatively bright, but also relatively narrow. It's specific on the hiring and supervising of uh, uh, family members, household members, which is a defined term. I'm happy to you know, answer any questions, but I do want to say that uh, I'm going to propose one amendment. I want to sort of briefly explain why. On page four, subsection D, there is an exception, which essentially says an employee who is a supervisor or executive director is unable to waive or disengage from completing their official duties or from taking official action that directly impacts relative uh, or household member. Uh, my concern with that is that exception, I, I don't want to be too big or to, to overstate. And so the language I propose would be on line 14, which would say, and is legally required to take action that directly impacts a relative or household member. Um, I can give like a narrow example of that for example, somebody who is uh, by statute on collective bargaining, for example, who then has to uh, potentially uh, act to you know, bargain against something where they may have a household member uh, who is impacted by it. It's a, maybe not the best example. The idea is that there's a legal obligation that they have to fulfill that they can't excuse themselves. <clears throat> so let me pause there and see if there's any questions. And then maybe if we can take up the idea of the amendment first. No questions, but I'd like to thank you for adding the definition of household member in the earlier draft. Anyone else? So oh. maybe if I can ask if there's a motion to uh, add the amendment on line 14, page 4. Uh, after the word official action and is legally required to take action that directly impacts? I'll make the motion. Second. All right, the, the motion has been made and seconded. All who approve, please raise your hand. All right, thank you very much. Next up is the bill regarding funding Actually, grant and aid. Chair, do we need to also vote on the, the bill, bill itself? Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. I'm sorry. Yes, thank you, Vice Chair. We need to vote on the bill itself. All those in favor of the bill, please raise your hand. All right. The motion carries. All right, and next up, we have um, a proposed draft funding grant and aid for county ethics boards or commissions. Robert? Thank you. So one of the uh, issues that was identified early is that under our constitution, there's both a state ethics and then county ethics uh, entities, which may have different titles, either commission or board, for example, depending on which county you're in. 
and the constitution delegates certain responsibilities to these entities. One of the concerns that's highlighted um, is that some of those commissions do not have any full-time staff associated with them and rely entirely on volunteers. And so I think there is a open and legitimate question about whether or not they have the resources necessary in order to fulfill their constitutional and, and, and sometimes county obligations. So two proposals are in front of you, and the first one is the idea of a grant and aid, which is essentially to try to help provide funding, which in my mind maybe could be opportunities, a bridge to try to get to the point where they have more sustainable funding from the county. Um, I would also similarly like to make an amendment to include Honolulu. Uh, to be frank, um, Honolulu appears just on surface to be well-funded, but I recognize I'm maybe not the best judge of that, and we should go ahead and allow them to have the opportunity to apply for granted aid and make their case. So I would uh, propose to include language similar to what's there for the other counties, also for Honolulu. Question? Yeah, any discussion? Yeah. Um, I was wondering, uh, is it unusual for this state to fund um, county agencies, county government agencies? I'm not too familiar with the other cases like this. Is this a re a, because the uh, other counties do not have commissions or, or are they underfunded? I think in every case, the every county has some form of a commission or a board. It's my understanding that each neighbor island has a deputy, a corporation council assigned to those entities and no other staff are provided. And in some cases, those corporation councils is just one of their assignments. And so the reliance is entirely on, you know, whoever the volunteer appointees to do the investigations, the research, et cetera. And that might sometimes reflect in how they handle complaints. They don't accept complaints from the public unless they're sworn in a complaint form, for example, which hmm. likely, again, from an outside point of view, is likely going to stymie people coming forward with complaints because, you know, who's going to want to sign a legal affidavit saying that they're submitting the complaint? Um, this is a long-winded way of saying plainly there's a funding situation. It's difficult for a state legislator to dictate to the counties, you shall fund better. And so I think this is an attempt to offer a carrot as a proposal. And again, it's obviously gonna be up to the legislature and their ability to fund such a thing. I would not anticipate this would be a long-term solution, but more of a bridge solution to get to the point where they're able to be more robust and, and stand up on their own. Well, I know that the federal government sometimes, well, used to in the past, offer uh, money to start new programs, uh, kind of pilot programs, and if the state used the money, then they were more apt to continue the program. Um, so in the case of some counties, there there really is no professional investigation, so it's, it's up to the volunteer board to pursue it. Correct. So this would be for investigators, it doesn't seem to specify. I, it does not. I think the attempt would be is to offer an opportunity for grant and aid. I think the counties would have to come forward and identify what they would like the money for and how they'd want to use it. So I think it would still sort of depend on the counties to help identify how they would use it, and then the legislature ultimately would have to say that that's a worthwhile purpose for it. Does a Honolulu County have an investigator? Honolulu County does. They're currently, I think, around 11 or 12 staff. So I am quite... Um, le le as I said in the beginning, I do not believe they necessarily need additional funding, but I also don't want to um, expressly write them out of the opportunity to come in and say, justify why they might need more. Okay, thank you. Thank you. The clerk, well, Janet, you first. Robert, do each of the uh, County Ethics Commission have uh, an anonymous tip line where people can report complaints? No, they do not. So for example, I'm aware at least one county, for example, um, refuses to accept anonymous complaints, that you have to submit it in the form of a declaration or affidavit with your name, et cetera, mm -hmm. which you can make policy reasons for why they want to go that direction. 
Um, but I think from a spirit of trying to um, identify corruption, you know, the reason why we have whistleblower protection, et cetera, is to sometimes allow people who have inside information to reveal that. And so um, I think if they had additional funding and the ability to handle greater levels of capacity, you know, greater levels of complaints, then they might be more open to that type of direction. What do you think about the idea of adding it as a condition of the funding? Um, I think it's something that we could discuss. Um, I think there's going to have to be some change to the rules and statutes. So I mean, it may not be as simple as simply just agreeing to do okay. it. Okay. Seems kind of important. I think the hope would be is once they have some professional staff that can start handling capacity, then they can have those discussions. And so it's maybe a bit of a chicken or the egg situation. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Any posts? Robert, could you uh, uh, clarify uh, whether or not uh, counties have an obligation to have ethics commissions or something like it uh, through the state constitution? They do, under the state constitution, have an obligation to have it um, in addition, there is some delegation to both the legislature and the county councils in this case to identify what's sort of within that scope of those ethics commissions. And th this was passed obviously in 78, correct? Um, during the last, or was it even before? Not that it matters. It's, it's probably been a long standing constitutional obligation for, for county governments to have, you know, an ethics commission along the lines of what. Honolulu County has, and even with the staffing, you know, we've seen with recent, very recent, right headlines and uh, decades of corruption that it's not always been effective in countering, you know, very explicit, you know, corruption in, say, uh, DPP, for example. So my concern is that. You know, uh, we're using the grant and aid process here to, to provide incentives to, <laughs> to county governments to, to engage in conduct that they should already be doing. They're, they're, they're essentially shirking their constitutional obligation to provide for, for something like an ethics commission at the county level. And with respect to, to funding, you know, county governments have a property tax base that is unavailable to state government. And with rising property tax values, you know, we have the lowest effective property tax rates in the nation. And it's way, that way by conscious design. Um, so I would argue that, you know, when you're taking money from nonprofit organizations and other, uh, other organizations that are providing needed benefits to, to our communities, um, and, and giving it to, you know, county governments that have been relatively lax in their constitutional obligations. I think it sends a very bad message. So I'm, in, I'm inclined to abstain from the, the, the funding, but I will support, you know, certainly support the resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Nikos. Good point. Robert, do you think the bill could be um, address Nikos's concern by making it clear that this is a, uh, a pilot uh, intended to incent the counties to fulfill their constitutional yeah. duties, something like that? Because, because the thing that concerns me is that there have certainly been egregious ethics issues that came up in the past two years in the counties. and we're left wondering, well, why wasn't investigation, a thorough investigation done? Um, I, I plainly do think we could add additional language to indicate that this is intended as a pilot to incentivize um, uh, looking at you know, better adequately addressing. And again, I think that would go quite well with essentially the second or the next bill that we're going to be talking about or uh, resolution that we're going to be talking about. Uh, again, I, I, I fully hear the concern of should the state be funding the county, shouldn't this be the county's responsibility, um, but it's much like the federal government in approaching states that aren't adequately doing something. You can pass statutes saying you should do it, you know, unfunded mandates, quote unquote. Um, and I think if really the purpose here is to try to address corruption, if the funding's available and, and if the legislature decides it's appropriate, 
um, you know, this could be a quick way to try to ramp up. And once you've ramped up, you know, the idea is that that's inherently going to be more likely to become the status quo and what people think should happen. Right now, the status quo is a perception that, you know, essentially a corp council is, is sufficient. And, and I would like to try to push to change that attitude. Um, I'd also like to address that the county of Honolulu, until relatively recently, was also relatively unfunded. And it's been a relatively newer uh, you know, change that they've gotten a greater staff. And I think it's in part, much like what we're doing here, is in part in reaction to some of the corruption challenges that have happened. Um, so I hope that the timing is right for everyone to agree that, that resources should be prioritized and allocated here, and the intent is to try to get started quicker. Um, I would uh, propose maybe we defer this one, and we can try to do additional language. All right, deferred to our next meeting. Okay. Should we yeah. do a vote on defer? Oh, yeah, we should. I, I'm just, Thank I'm, you. I, I, actually, right. I was a little tongue in cheek. All of us wanting to defer, <laughs> please raise your hands. Thanks a lot. All right. Okay. Barbara, you are. I'm abstaining. You're abstaining. All right. Um, on the next matter, which is, um, I think, in part to respond uh, to uh, Professor Randy Ross' suggestions of trying to do an analysis of sort of why some of these entities are functioning or not functioning. Again, this is maybe a bit more specific to ethics, um, but the idea was is to try to encourage the counties to do something similar to what we are doing here with looking at their own structures to try to identify areas where they could see improvement. And it, again, it's a resolution, but the idea is it would be a call for the counties to then take up this, this mantle um, so similarly to sort of, I think, Nikos's comments of are they adequately funding, are more systemic changes necessary in order to do a better job? So this um, is a resolution, not proposed legislation, but still intended to highlight the issue. Any questions? No questions. I just have a comment that I think that, you know, we, we've raised a very important issue here at a very key juncture in the electoral cal calendar about, you know, whether or not a particular county official who, who is running for office has a commitment perspective going forward, you know, that, you know, ethics be a, a key part of county government. Um, so I, I'm definitely uh, in full support of this resolution. And uh, mahalo to uh, Robert for introducing it. All right. Um, so, by a show of hands, can we have a um, motion to approve this? Um, can we have a motion for something? I have a motion. <laughs> motion. <laughs> Thank you, because all in favor, please raise your hand. All right. The proposed resolution is adopted. Next, we have. Um, a proposed law that would require reporting uh, legislative allowance expenditures online. Robert? Thank you, uh, Chair. This is one that we have discussed previously as well, so I, I won't go into it in too much detail. Um, each uh, legislator is allocated a percentage of their salary, uh, a legislative allowance. Um, the as the salaries go up, the legislative allowance amount goes up. And so, you know, again, we're talking relatively significant sums of money. This information currently is public, but it's not the easiest to get a hold of. And so the attempt here is simply to say that it should be posted online and to make that a requirement. This was also a part of our interim report proposal that we had asked uh, essentially the legislature to do it because they could do it themselves. However, um, Again, the idea is maybe to try to be more specific and actually put this into statute. Fairly straightforward. Any discussion? I'd like to move it. Thank you, Nikos. Uh, second. The motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor, please raise your hand. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, moving on to uh, the fourth draft bill. I'm sorry, the fifth draft bill, 
requiring legislatures to disclose financial relationships with lobbyists and lobbying organizations. Thank you, Chair. This matter goes a little bit to what Senator Ruderman was testifying about earlier with regards to uh, legislators uh, who are part-time employees who frequently will have other positions, whether they be uh, employees, owners, contractors, et cetera. Um, there is, this is an attempt to try to require disclosure specific to um, business or financial interests that they have that might be connected to legislators, uh, sorry, to lobbyists or lobbying organizations uh, with the idea that that's probably the area where the public's gonna be the most concerned. So hypothetically, if somebody is in a law firm and that law firm represents a lobbying organization, the idea is that that's something that would have to be disclosed and be made public. Um, I, I do have to admit that this is um, uh, you know, bold. I recognize some would say that may, maybe it needs to be bolder, but this would have, I think, pretty wide ra ranging ramifications, particularly if somebody is a part of a large operation, there potentially could be a lot of disclosures. Um, and so I just want to be cognizant that I think we are trying to thread a needle here by identifying lobbying organizations and lobbyists as sort of being the most particular of concern. Um, and I think we also have to recognize that there may be some uh, challenge to this, you know, both politically and legally. Questions? I have a question, Robert. And it concerns a comment that Senator Ruderman made where he thought it would be a good idea for the legislator to disclose their dollar share of the settlement. Um, there's no such related requirement in here, right? Uh, maybe I'll let Nikos maybe um, articulate maybe the, the thought on it. Yeah, well, you know, we. I'm going to support this bill because I think it's a it's uh, I, I think it's a really key measure in terms of this commission's work product and it's a really good start in sort of untangling this this situation where you have uh, policy where you have legislators uh, benefiting from you know financial entanglements with with consultancy firms or professional firms that that do business with state and local governments. And uh, the, the fact scenario that I, I raised with uh, Senator Ruderman uh, came from, you know, uh, the, the legislature frequently has to share, uh, to budget for legal judgments for misconduct of various levels. For example, you know, if there's an environmental issue that, you know, they need to pay, you know, compensatory and punitive damages for. Um, sometimes that might be brought by, you know, a local law firm who has a legislator as a partner. I'm not saying that they're not providing a very valuable service in, in getting, in seeking justice and getting, you know, their, their due share. My concern is with the fact that there, there might be almost sort of a, an incentive for state agencies not to take perspective, you know, remedial measures um, <laughs> so that legislators can continue to benefit from, from ongoing government and misconduct. I hope that's not the case, but I think we need some sort of objective indicator um, out there in the public where legislators who are members of professional organizations, consultancy firms, law firms, that, that, that receive judgments at least report, you know, you know, on an item by item basis how much money they received from a particular judgment. I don't think it's unreasonable. I don't think it, you know, raises a lot of constitutional questions. And I think, you know, it, it should be an expectation that, you know, our public dollars that have been expended to, to pay for government misconduct you know, be accounted for. And, and that's, that's all I ha really have to say on that front. If I'm understanding this correctly, the person would not have to disclose the exact amount of their um, 
I think it would be preferable. I'm not going to call. I'm not. I'm not even going to call for an amendment to yeah. this bill. I would yeah. like this bill to move yes. forward as yes. is. But and I, the reason I'm asking about this is, truthfully, I don't think it would always be practical for the person no. to know the exact amount of money that they would re be receiving because during that because of timing differences and so forth. So sure. this this has categories that they can sure. select, and I think that's appropriate. It is a very important bill. It is something that's been missing, and I think it's well well worthwhile. So thank you for your work, both of you. So I'll move to, uh, if there, if you can ask for further questions or comments. Anybody else, Barbara? You know, does this concern only lawyers or other people who benefit from um, the legislation or decisions? Yes. This would require disclosure if you're receiving money from a lobbying organization or lobbyist, uh, it, it, which would include if it's your employer receiving that money, whether it includes a partner or a business partner. So, so nothing to do with lawyers, but the, the circumstance of which if you had a consulting firm or a law firm or something else and they're receiving money, uh, that you'd also have to disclose that, that, that your employer is also receiving money from a lobbyist or lobbying organization. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the classic examples would be if you worked for a lobbying organization, you'd have to disclose that. If you had a consulting firm that worked for lobbying organizations or your partner in the consulting firm worked for a lobbying organization, you'd have to disclose that just to show that there is a financial interest there. Um, I think, you know, a, a big concern would be that the way a lobbyist or lobbying organization could have influence over legislature is essentially by employing them, and that's completely allowed currently, um, we wouldn't be changing that, but we'd now be requiring greater levels of disclosure of it. Uh, if you recall, I think we had had a discussion before about trying to do a full-time legislature and basically say you can't be employed outside of legislature in part to try to do away with some of this. This is the less extreme approach, you know, so to speak, of still allowing employment and still allowing them to go do it, but the idea is we're trying to make it more public and more visible mm -hmm. and transparent. So if you work for a company or a union and you receive a beneficial um, treatment from the legislature, um, you wouldn't have to report it unless you really got a, a dollar amount. But if you if it benefited your company or your union, then you don't report it. Um, so if you were working for a union and received, or, or your um, significant other worked for a union, um, and you received more than $5,000, we'd be asking you to disclose it. So you'd have to receive that money? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'll move the bill. Thank you. because. Um, may I have a second? I'll Thank second. you, Bob. All right, all those in favor, please raise your hand. All right, the motion carries. Next, we have um, a bill regarding compelling lobbyists to disclose matters lobbied with greater specificity. Robert? This is a relatively simple bill. Currently, lobbyists would just sort of have to disclose the subject area they're testifying on. So for example, energy, environment, et cetera. This would actually require them to identify specificity, the House bill, Senate bill, uh, administrative rules with specificity of what they lobbied on. And you know, I'd also argue the stuff that they're drafting. So if they drafted a bill and proposed it, that's something they'd have to, to disclose uh, in their registration form. Um, and I think in discussions, for example, some nonprofit organization testifies in dozens of bills, um, and in this situation, they'd now be ob obliged to identify those dozens of bills. So it is an onus on the, the lobbyist, I will recognize, but I do think that this is directly responding to some of the public uh, concern about sort of what lobbyists are working or not working on and sort of try to make that more transparent. Any discussion? I think this is a good bill. Uh, and I, and I would hope that uh, the commission, or uh, Robert and the commission could take a friendly amendment and insert budget item on line 10 on page four. 
because there's a lot of lobbying that goes on with respect to the budget. Um, and I, I, think we, I think it's important to, to sort of include that. Do, do you foresee any uh, hiccups with that? Can you? Uh, you know, fi you know, budget and finance comes down with the budget, and every many appropriations have specific numbers on it. For example, um, the nonprofits that I've been engaged with um, testified against the budget item uh, relating to the construction of a new jail facility in Halaba. We certainly weren't the only organizations t testifying on that particular budget item. Um, you can be sure that we were probably outnumbered to a significant degree. Um, unlike other lobbyists and lobbying organizations, you know, we, we provided written testimony. So I, I think it would also cover, you know, activities that do not, are not memorialized in writing when we ask that lobbyists disclose specific items that they're, that they're, they're working on. I, I would support the friendly amendment. I will note um, currently all of the registrations are online. In the, in the ideal yep. world, somebody who was testifying on House Bill 1, for example, we would be able to online identify House Bill 1 consistently. So anybody could click on that and see mm -hmm. all the lobbyists who registered on it. From a just sheer technical perspective, how we would capture testified on Halava, for example, in a budget, we may not be able to, you know, it might just be a written description and it would be you know, maybe less visible. Um, so maybe uh, if this bill moves along, gets in the legislature, we can sort of try to figure out ways to try to, again, try to get to with specificity to allow it mm -hmm. to be more public friendly. So again, full open door on the friendly amendment, just, you know, pragmatically, how do we make it as identifiable as possible? From the commission's perspective or from the lobbyist perspective or both? Uh, I guess more from an administrative perspective of the Ethics Commission of trying to administer this. So if someone says, I lobbied on page 16 of the budget, or I lobbied on line, you know, just trying to, how do we get to the point where the public will then be able to really know what that is? I, I'm not as familiar enough with identifiers of the budget, like yeah. how to like, you know, make it obvious what is being done. But, but the, you know, the amendments yeah. certainly friendly. We can, if nothing else, just have an open field where people have to write in what they're working on. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not very versed in the. I, I only learn through experience um, on this front. Um, so yeah. Um, Is that true of all of us? <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah. Thank you for for agreeing to accept the friendly amendment. I have a question, um, and it pertains to what Lynn brought up in her testimony, where she. Um, recommended <coughs> that uh, lobbyists have to disclose if they actually drafted a bill? Um, so I, I think this would include, you know, if you drafted and submitted something, that this would have to include that you worked on it. I think the, um, we, you know, we kicked around different concepts of, you know, how is something going to be, you know, anything submitted to the legislature uh, would have to be reported and who it came from. So like any draft that came in, uh, then it became like, you, it, you know, and I think that's probably the better way of doing it. Whereas I think the lobbyist essentially, you know, may not, uh, I, I think there'd be too many gaps to, you know, get around having to actually identify that they drafted it. So I'm, I'm just not sure from this angle, this is the best way to capture it. Again, they'd have to identify that they worked on it. Um, but for it to be, again, the reporting cycle is usually af, you know, sort of, you know, through the session or, you know, so by the time you found out, it may not be you know, particularly relevant information. I'd go back to, you know, we could look at an idea that anything submitted to the legislature as a form of a draft has to be reported um, out. Uh, there were some logistical issues that people are identifying with that of, you know, you know, what if it went to a staff person? Do they have affirmative obligation to turn it in? Just, you know, there's, there's some issues with it, but I mean, I think the, the we can still have discussion on it. Okay, thank you. So. I'm, I'm kind of thinking out loud here, but I think maybe um, so, something that, well, and I'm not proposing another amendment to this bill, but in, in relation to what the concern Janet raised, I think 
maybe you know such correspondence but should be part of the of the bill history the formal bill history not to be posted online um, but just as a matter of you know sort of the you know the, the materials that are collected by the state archives maybe should have some of those drafts and we encourage legislators and maybe even lobbyists so I, I think the legislature should have the obligation to kind of submit those kinds of documents um, just as a as a matter of course um, but that's it's kind of after the fact um, and you know with 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 respect to yeah with the public yeah. bill of rights we can look at adding an additional section that would ask that any proposed drafts be part of the legislative record mm. and that that would capture it and that would be a part you know in in sort of the process itself I fear that might be con a little bit more confusing to, to folks out there, if you know what I mean, in terms of having it on, on the website. I think, you know, conference amendments are, are a different issue. Um, but in terms of the policy committees. I, I guess yeah. I was envisioning it being testimony, right? I mean, okay. So here's a proposed draft of blah, 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 and that gets post posted. You know, here it came from so-and-so. And it could just be a part of the testimony that's on the record. Okay. All right then. Uh, I, think, I think the representative has Barbara. It. So a lobbyist may introduce a, uh, ask for a bill to be introduced. They may draft it, but it has to be disclosed. So, so what's proposed here, if they are lobbying on a matter, so that would include drafting, the time spent drafting, submitting it, asking someone to introduce it, they would have to identify that they worked on that bill. We wouldn't be asking anything more specific than I worked on House Bill 1, and that would be part of the record, that'd be public. I'm using House Bill 1 just as a for example. Um, okay. That what they did, you know, I spent 10 hours working with somebody, right? You know, that, that would not be something we'd ask for. It would I just see. be, I worked on the bill, that's it. Okay. So you. rather than just saying I worked on bills in the energy area, which is what we currently do, or bills in, uh, you know, transportation, now you actually have to identify the bill or the administrative rule you worked on with specificity. Okay, even though sometimes the bills change numbers. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, perfect. Do I have a motion on this? I, I move the amendment to include a budget item on uh, page four, line 10. All those in favor of the amendment, please raise your hand. All right, and I'll move um, the bill. Yes, um, Commissioner Marmoto, you are abstaining. No, I raised my hand. You did on the okay. amendment. Thank you. Um, now, um, so I think that was on the amendment. Yes, that was on the amendment. Um, are we ready to vote on the bill itself? I think so. I'll move. I'll move. Make right. a motion. Second. I'll second. Thank you. Commissioner Marmoto. I'm not th that familiar with that bill. I can't find this bill in this fact, so oh. sorry. Okay. Um, let's, let's pause for a minute so that we can. Which one is this? In this stack. Just a moment of technical work here. Okay, I thought I, 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 I just didn't see. Not like very environmentally friendly and printed everything. <laughs> This is um, item 4F that we're on. She's got it. Okay. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay, so are we now ready to vote on um, item 4F with amendments? All those in favor, raise your hand, please. Thank you. All right. We are making progress. Uh, next up is the seventh measure we're considering, which would establish a mandatory lobbyist training program. Robert? I think this one's relatively self-explanatory. Um, again, much like the mandatory training for state employees that passed this past year, 
the attempt would be to require lobbyists to go through training in order to be kept abreast of any changes, uh, any amendments, any things that go on. Um, I do have to note that we do offer lobbyist training already and we actually do get relatively high participation. And so the hope would be this would not be significant, you know, a significant burden on individuals who are lobbying who lar in large part do already participate in training. But the idea would be to try to capture some of the individual, you know, the, the relative handful of people who are not going through the training currently. In addition, it would require as a condition of um, registration that they'd have to go through the training program um, as sort of a means to capture people who are coming in late or are registering to be a lobbyist later in, in the process. In order to be able to register, they have to keep it. Um, I do want to note one comment um, that was made earlier was who should keep the certificate of completion. Again, I think normally what we do is we will keep records of everyone who's gone through the program, um, but in the event of a dispute, you know, the idea is we're still asking the individuals to keep their records or certificates uh, in their possession. So that way, if there is a dispute, you know, there is sort of a, you know, they are able to prove that they took the course. Um, any other questions? Just uh, a, one small question. Are these training courses um, online or are they, are they easy for the person to, um, take part in if they happen to start lobbying after the first week of session, or how does that work? Um, so currently we do have self-directed online courses that take about 30 minutes to go through. The intent would be is to have a similar program. The reason why this doesn't go into effect till July 1st, 2024, is to give time to make sure that that's available. We okay. also offer Zoom live Zoom training classes which we generally kind of push people towards because there's an opportunity to ask questions, to hear other people's questions, and to hear it sort of in a collective group, it sometimes is better. But again, the reason why there's sort of a late implementation program is to make sure we're able to have something online. So the idea is if somebody needs to register, they can take a 20 to 30 minute course and then be able to register. Thank you for that important clarification. Of course. Okay. Um, the definition of a lobbyist, is it Someone who uh, makes their living primarily by lobbying? It's somebody who is paid, uh, and I believe it's more than 10 hours of work. So you actually have to have be paid to do it. Um, it does not have to be the primary. Again, 10 hours is a relatively small number of hours to be working on but it. There's a lot of social services that devote a lot of time to lobbying. And they would be asked, and they are currently asked, in the current definition of lobbyist, they would be asked to register as a lobbyist. So uh, a lot of nonprofits do actively register as lobbyists, in part because of that. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? If not, may I have a motion to? I'll move the bill. Thank you, Nikos. Second. Thank you, Barbara. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you very much. All right, moving on, we have our eighth measure, which would prevent lobbyists from giving prohibitive gifts to legislators or state employees. Robert. Currently, there is a gift restriction in the state code of ethics, which applies to legislators, state employees, and board and commission members. Um, that definition of what gifts can or cannot be received has uh, been amended and changed over time. And so there has been some controversy over it. I do want to duly recognize it. The current administrative rules largely <coughs> prohibit gifts from legislators uh, to state employees or, or uh, legislators, sorry, uh, gifts from lobbyists or lobbying organizations. The rationale for that, again, is that from a objective, reasonable appearance, that looks improper. And so it doesn't necessarily matter that that lobbyist is attempting to influence a legislator. The, the, the statute basically will indicate that the public could reasonably infer that it was intended to influence somebody's official action. So currently, um, there is a general prohibition on uh, lobbyists or contractors, people who are you know uniquely trying to get take uh, uh, 
benefit from a, uh, official action from giving a gift. Uh, there are some exceptions, which include, for example, giving of lay, uh, giving of a, a certificate or a diploma. There's some exceptions allowed for like educational programs. And again, happy to kind of dive into some of the particulars of that. One of the challenges, however, has been because there is no restriction on lobbyists from giving gifts, they'll go ahead and do it. And we've had complaints from state employees who will say, hey, I keep having the same lobbyists coming by, I keep offering this to me, and I have to keep telling them no, and I know they're going from each office. So the attempt is just to create sort of a reciprocal obligation. So uh, legislators and state employees can't take it, and lobbyists can't give it if it's in violation. You know, the hope would be is that lobbyists would engage in conversation with their office and talk about what they can or can't do, would ask for advice ahead of doing things, and just try to basically curtail some of the problems, again, by trying to have a reciprocal obligation on both the legislator, the, the state employee, and the lobbyist. And that's what this bill is attempting to craft. Nikos? You first, Janet. Um, in the interest of, what did you call it, a friendly amendment? I would like to um, suggest that the um, fine, the proposed administrative fine, since it's a formula shall not exceed, um, that it be bumped up to $10,000. So in the interest of being bolder and underscoring that it is serious, mm -hmm. um, there would be, you know, it would make people take notice a little bit. Um, I would probably abstain on it in part because there are mirroring provisions in the state ethics code, for example, on the penalties to state employees and legislators. And so for ramping up one, there's sort of some level of like, you know, being an eye of sort of being consistent throughout. Mm -hmm. In addition, it's per violation. So for example, there was a publicized incident where one lobbyist provided bottles of wine to every legislator and then had to publicly pull them back out. In that case, that'd be 76 violations in that one situation, right? So um, obviously it's up to 10,000, so the, the commission has full ability to not go that high, but I just do want to sort of recognize even under $1,000, it can be a significant. Um, but, but again, uh, if the commission wants to move forward with the amendment, um, I would probably abstain on it. Any I, appetite for moving forward to with this amendment? Given Robert's feedback, I don't think it's really necessary. All right. I just wanted, um, if if I could offer that, I just wanted to to get well first to get clarification and then to well let me start with the comment. Um, as as many people know, I was on the continent for an extended period of time during my life and. When I first came back to Honolulu, to this environment, it was very striking to me to see how much, I don't know what you want to call them, gifts of aloha, I don't know what the vernacular is, but to see spreads <laughs> of food, food in legislative offices. I know people like to eat here, people like to eat everywhere, but to me it was reminiscent of you know, the bad old days of lobbying in Sacramento in the, in the 50s and 60s that gave rise to a full-time professional legislator where you had a character named Artie Shamish who was across the street, always had a full buffet, open bar, um, women or men, depending on one's proclivities, uh, available uh, for, for uh, enjoyment as well. Um, and I think this, this kind of, this bill is long overdue. Um, and I would just like the clarification that we are still allowed that people who register as lobbyists, whether or not they're Bishop Street lobbyists or nonprofit lobbyists, are allowed to provide uh, books and written materials that are, you know, antiquarian or exceed, you know, a certain amount is still allowable. Um, thank you for the comments. I, if you don't mind, if I can respond just briefly to it, because I think it is important to underscore um, 
The Gifts of Aloha term was created by the Ethics Commission, and the intent was to recognize uh, reciprocal gifts. So for example, if a neighbor gives you a uh, mangoes from their tree, you might provide them tangerines later in the season. And the idea is it's uh, reciprocal gifts that are sort of common, normal, every day, not necessarily above uh, reproach or concern. And unfortunately, over time, I think it was perceived that the gifts were one way directional, that they'd only flow, um, and it's unique to the legislative office. We don't get complaints from librarians, for example, on the amount of um, uh, food that they receive every day. And so, in part, some of the rule changes that were proposed were an attempt to try to eliminate sort of the expectation. And again, I think the perception is bad from the public's point of view. If they see this, they recognize it, and they think, you know, it's just a corrupt atmosphere. But even if it isn't a corrupt atmosphere, it does create a slippery slope over time where the expectation is that if I'm in office that I get to receive these things and it could eventually lead to more blatantly corrupt behavior. And, and again, I think the idea is to try to create uh, a environment where the expectation is gifts you know, can't be given or they shouldn't be given and that you know, essentially everybody is going to be put in the same footing, uh, whether you are a rich lobbyist or if you're a nonprofit you know, who really is just trying to push an idea that everybody is on the same footing. Um, and yes, absolutely, the idea of disseminating information, research, or reports would not be considered a gift. Again, it, you know, it would have to be something of, you may find this funny, uh, it would have to be something of value, uh, monetary value, uh, necessarily for it to be um, questioned. Um, so hopefully that, that helps answer your question. And, and again, I, I am in agreement that this is an important effort, and I do hope it directly relates to sort of why this, this commission was created. Thank you, and I definitely appreciate the point about um, not all lobbyists having the same capability for gifts. It's important. We don't, we don't want decisions to be made on the basis of rich lobbyists. Uh, what will this bill allow? What kind of gifts? Malasadas? So the existing exceptions um, would still remain. So there are exceptions to the gift rule. And so again, the classic example would be lay, you know, attending an event in a lay. Um, it would allow, so again, the common question we've gotten from legislators is what if one of my constituents drops by and drops something off? And again, the idea is it's a constituent. There isn't that relationship issue. And so generally speaking, we say okay to that. It's really specific in this, this is specific to lobbyists. Right, who are essentially here solely, you know, generally speaking, solely for the purpose of trying to influence official action. And there's just an appearance issue that they should not be giving gifts. And that's why that's targeted to them. What is the them. cutoff area? Lunch, dinner, vacation? Oh. Is the lunch allowable? Uh, no, it would not be allowable. So the, uh, again, the restriction from lobbyist to legislator, there are some clear defined exceptions um, where there is um, uh, not an exception, if somebody wants to make the argument that current rules have a three-part test. Who is giving it? Uh, what's the value of the gift? And what's the state purpose? So the state purpose question would be for things like lunches, movie tickets, golf. You would argue that's really kind of an entertainment purpose and there really isn't a state purpose to that per se. Invitations to, say, an educational conference, a speaker flying in, those are things that have been allowed, um, but still they're somewhat scru scrutinized. Again, if it's a lobbyist giving it, you know, is this truly an educational conference or is this just really an attempt to do a meet and greet or something else? And so those are the types of discussions that we have with state employees and legislators almost on a daily basis. Um, and the idea is we sort of encourage them to come seek advice and the idea is we try to work it out and how to, how to do it. Um, Again, there's nothing prohibiting lobbyists and legislators from talking. We want that. There's nothing having them having extensive discussions or even going out to lunch together and the legislator buys their own lunch. It's the idea to avoid that appearance that every single time you go out, a lobbyist is going to buy it for you. I, to me, a lunch is not that, you know, you don't sell your soul for, for lunch. Um, I. 
I hear that, and again, that's a common argument by many legislators. I'm not gonna be corrupted by a lunch, right? And again, I would go back to the test isn't so much is there actual corruption there or influence that created there, but what does the public see? Right. What does the public perceive? And I, I guess I will give one last thing. You know, I, I had an opportunity to talk to Gary Gill about this. We, we bounced off him, and one of the common teammates that when he was chair of the city council, every single day he could go out to lunch with somebody or be invited out to lunch with somebody and just, just assumed it's because he was such a popular, wonderful guy. <laughs> and the day that he was out of the city council, a lot of those things all dried up and they disappeared. And it really sort of demonstrated the fact mm. that the reason why he's being invited out was because of the position, not because of him. And I just sort of underscore, I mean, that's the type of thing that we're trying to address here, right? Is, you know, it's the lobbyist asking out because you are the chair of such such committee versus, uh, uh, you know, attempt to just socialize. Mm. I think I, I would not mind the lunch so much, but I think maybe it should be reported. I'll, I'll really abstain on this, this one. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? No. And <clears throat> I don't believe there are any, well, there was a proposed amendment, but that has gone to the uh, another world, <laughs> so. Uh, may I have a motion to vote on the I'll move the bill. proposed draft? I'll second. <coughs> motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor, please raise your hands. And are you abstaining? abstaining? Thank you. The motion is adopted. Now we are plunging into the world of House and Senate rules with a discussion proposing uh, changes to the rules governing conflicts of interest. Robert? <coughs> so I think this is a topic that this commission has talked about before. Uh, the concern being, or at least the appearance being, that the legislature is relatively quick to say that a uh, legislator does not have a conflict of interest sometimes seemingly pro forma without really an examination of the actual issues. The proposal here that you have in front of you is attempting to make recusal the default position if there is a conflict of interest. It and additionally goes beyond just not voting, but it, you know, sort of it, it tries to prevent people from talking about matters behind the scenes or advocating for it behind the scenes and essentially says you really just need to stay away from that issue. It also takes a broader definition of conflict of interest. And again, this is in direct response to um, the former attorney general making reference to having indicted somebody uh, and then having that person uh, vote against her confirmation. Um, so, you know, instead of just looking at financial conflicts of interest, it is a broader definition of conflict of interest. Um, and that's, you know, again, deliberate um, with the idea that um, recusal in those situations should be the default position. It does not require disclosure of why someone is um, recusing themselves. And the thought was we want to encourage people to recuse themselves. And if they are perhaps embarrassed about the conflict of interest or don't want to get in the details, we don't want them to feel tempted just to say nothing. So the idea is they can recuse and they don't have to bring up anything. It's just they're assumed that they're recused. It's only in the circumstance where they're asking for an exception uh, to the recusal um, or an exception for the conflict of interest, you know, A, in a decision of do I have a conflict of interest, and B, in a situation where there's just, they need enough votes to move forward. Um, the threshold to get past that is a two-thirds vote. It requires public disclosure of the basis for the conflict of interest and a full public discourse about it. And I think the belief is that the legislature you know, that's gonna not necessarily be the preferred course, that is gonna be a pretty harsh course. And so the idea is it's gonna be a remedy there, it's available, but it's not gonna be a preferred one. Um, and again, responding to like Senator Rhodes's example or discussion point when he came in, where he's afraid of recusals too easy, it allowed people to duck harsh votes or difficult votes, for example, tax bills or uh, very uh, contentious issues. And so I think the idea of at least allowing some recourse to actually ask that person to disclose what is your conflict of interest and allowing that vote to occur 
is a mechanism to allow the legislature to continue to function in the times that it does. But again, I don't think that's gonna be a preferred way to get around difficult conflicts. Any questions, thoughts? <laughs> So only if a member is uncertain does the map, does the presiding officer have to make a determination. Is that the way this works? So uncertain or if they need to have votes and in that situation they would still have to go to a vote. Okay. And, and a vote would be on the conflict of interest itself. The pertinent language, for example, in the House rules is, if the presiding officer determines that no conflict exists, the matter will be presented to the floor or committee, and if two-thirds of the voting members agree, the member shall be allowed to participate in discussion, debate, and voting. It continues on, members who have a conflict or possible conflict with respect to voting on the status of another member's conflict shall recuse themselves from that vote without further recourse. Okay. Well, to me, this is a very important aspect of aspiring to change the culture um, to make it easier and, as, as written, the default that you do recuse yourself if you believe there's a conflict of interest. I rarely, I rarely see this. This, this is a bold step, and I, again, uh, to address Senator Ro Ruderman, you know, be bold. I think this is bold, and I think there's gonna be a lot of controversy over this, to be clear. This is gonna make things more difficult, and you know, I think in the balance of avoiding appearances of impropriety or avoiding potential corruption issues or you know, making the legislative process more difficult, I think we should recommend that you should err on the side of recusal and err on the side of avoiding the appearance of impropriety. Mm -hmm. well, I know you, put, you and your staff put a lot of thought into this and um, I think it's very important and I appreciate what you've done. Any other questions? I am undecided on this. I, I don't really understand it. If you don't mind, I will abstain. All right. Flo, we haven't forgotten about you out there. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, if no questions, um, may I have a motion to vote on this? I'll move the resolution, or move the item, sorry. I'll second it. Um, all right, voting on the motion to adopt the draft proposed Senate and House rules. If you are in favor, please raise your hands. And we have one abstention from Commissioner Maramoto. Thank may, you so much. May I just clarify for the record? Um, I think that these would be put in the form of a resolution. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you have the operative language and, and the, you know, the, what would be in the resolution, but I, just, I wanna be clear uh, as a mechanism sort of for adoption, I think the, the proposal would be to put it in a resolution. So there would be the standard cover language that we're seeing and everything else put there. Uh, we just didn't have the time to get to the actual drafting of the resolution All language. Right. Thank you for that, Robert. All right, um, last number 10 on our list of new items is a measure establishing rights for members of the public with respect to the conduct and operation of the legislature and its members, also referred to as a so-called Bill of Rights. Public Robert. Bill of Rights. <laughs> uh, thank you. I, I do want to recognize uh, Jim Sean for uh, submitting, um, I think, the original proposal for this. I think this is an attempt to sort of work off of what he submitted uh, many meetings ago. So I do, you know, again, want to recognize that. And I think it's an opportunity um, potentially to put in some additional factors in here. Uh, specifically sort of trying to highlight generally speaking the standards of conduct that we'd like to see the legislature to operate with um, one of the issues is if there is a concern or challenge with how the legislature is operating that there is an entity that can help investigate help report out and help sort of address the situation 
as drafted, and I'd call it a straw proposal, this creates a new entity called the Office of the Public Advocate. Um, I do not think that that's the preferred approach, but again, I'd call this a straw proposal for the sake of discussion. Um, I did have conversation with the Ombudsman's office, and they highlighted, and again, very cooperative and very thoughtful and had a very good discussion. Um, they did identify two concerns I think would have to be addressed with trying to put this into the office, the, uh, into the Ombudsman's office. Um, first one that you would expect, which is uh, resources in the term of uh, staffing and sort of recognition that they are currently at their maximum space capacity. So if they add additional staff, they'd essentially need more uh, office space. Um, assuming that could be resolved, the second concern is a bit more systemic, which is currently the Abundsman uh, is a legislative agency really with a task or purpose of looking at executive agencies to make sure they're functioning well, and essentially to be the tool of the legislature to kind of examine the exam executive branches. And so the appearance of having someone appointed by the legislature then in turn investigating legislature is challenging. Um, I think that's probably a discussion um, we may not have the full time to really get into. Um, and I, I would suggest maybe we simply in the report acknowledge that this uh, creation of this office is a placeholder and that more discussion should be had about whether this can be incorporated into an existing office for example, and again, I don't want to suggest this without the ombudsman and legislatures and others sort of weighing in on it, but for example, one you know idea might be is to have the ombudsman uh, appointed in the judiciary, for example, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, nominated perhaps by the judiciary, for example. So I, I do think there's things that could be addressed, but it's difficult to do it sort of in our narrow time frame. So again, the concept of an office of the public advocate, I just say this is sort of a placeholder. And I think ultimately it would be better to try to incorporate an existing office with existing administrative capacity, et cetera. Um, uh, one of the questions of why does this not go into the Ethics Commission, uh, because it does have some level of autonomy away from the legislature. And one of the concerns I have is currently the Ethics Commission has uh, a degree of enforcement capability, um, which is I think a bit different than the way this is currently structured, which is more of an investigatory um, and sort of reporting uh, capability and even publicizing capability, which is sort of more of what the Ombudsman Office currently does. And sort of mixing the enforcement capacity of the Ethics Commission and investigation and reporting, I think it's difficult. Um, typically when we start talking to people, they start asking, do I need a lawyer, for example? I mean, it's just a different kind of relationship. And I'd be sort of loath to try to you know, bridge that. But the, the um, bottom line is that the intent is it would not be um, an office that reports to the legislature. Correct. I think that would be something that would have to be a baseline, or at least you know isn't um, perceived as being an entity of the legislature. Okay. Um, and again, I, I don't think creating a new office necessarily is the best approach. But again, I think as a you know as a means to keep the discussion going, I think it's fine to have it the way it is now. Mm -hmm. um, and then hopefully you know over time maybe something. Uh, more creative can be created. I'm um, just turning in, in turn, there are a number of rights that are um, trying to address some of the things that the public has brought up uh, to us, which include um, um, the right to be treated um, with uh, respect, dignity, equity, fairness, and inclusion, and vice versa. Um, it also you know, talks about trying to avoid retaliation, such as eliminating positions in the budget or eliminating budgetary positions because somebody testified in a way that, that was not appreciated. Um, the right to present oral testimony, uh, to inspect written testimony no later than 24 hours after the testimony is submitted, um, the ability to review all bill drafts and proposed amendments before a vote occurs. It includes that uh, the expectation of the bill will not be uh, suddenly and substantially changed without a public hearing. Um, the opportunity for public and honest debate on every matter. Um, and it goes into, again, some of the things that we've discussed before, and again, not to belabor it, but um, subject matter committees um, will not pass bills with deliberate defects um, and an attempt to show the appropriation, again, not trying to blank that out, but actually show it so the public can see what's being associated with that bill. Um, 
the uh, right to try to avoid going to fiscal committees um, unless that's actually you know a critical matter involving the bill um, and then uh, it includes two more uh, includes the ability that no bill shall die because the conference committee uh, did not have a conference chair or did not uh, appear and then the right to inspect all communications including things like budgetary information submitted to the legislature so this is very comprehensive I think more can be included to be clear and I think I might uh, suggest we defer this uh, for until the next meeting if possible and I think the two things I'd like to try to include is some language about trying to address the sunshine concerns I think the best way to do it perhaps would be is to say that there'd be expectation that any decision making decisions would happen publicly or if discussions occurred privately that they'd have to be articulated in full as to why uh, certain decisions being made or not made. And that way the idea is that the public would have an opportunity to see that. I think it's also an opportunity potentially to address bill drafts and ask that if substantive bill drafts have been submitted to the legislature that they're, they're allowed to be made public. Again, this is sweeping. There's a lot here. Um, and uh, I hope this fulfills some of the intent of being bold. Robert, could you uh, potentially come down with a provisional answer as to where the public advocate should be housed, um, whether it be in the judiciary or um, I don't foresee it being in the AG's office, but um, when, when, you, when we float terms like public advocate and Niles, you know, it, it seems that it would be a potential fit, but. Um, I also support an inspector general mechanism, um, generally speaking, um, for, for government, but that's neither here nor there. So yeah, thank you for, for putting this uh, bill together and uh, look forward to continued conversation uh, around its contents. Uh, I, I would, again, give credit to both Jim Sean and also Casey Hines and his staff for really helping do the substantive heavy lifting on this. Um, currently, as drafted, it says it shall be within the Department of Attorney General for administrative purposes only. And I think part of the reason why it may be rejected, just giving this responsibility to the Attorney General's office, is recognizing they have an, a, a duty to uh, represent the legislators and, and you know, they do have an attorney client relationship. So it's maybe difficult to yeah. also ask them to investigate. So again, uh, this would be standalone from them. Robert, um, with respect to introducing deliberate defects, would it be possible to add a phrase saying concluding a defective date, a deliberate defective date? Because that practice is so widespread that, um, and people don't understand it uh, necessarily, but, um, you know, it. Uh, it should be apparent from the debate and discussion that the bill needs additional work. So putting the defective date is troubling. Sure, I, that's squarely what that that uh, section eight was intended to address. And I think it was, I think including a defective date, you know, comma and comma is, is perfectly fine. I think the reason why it's broader is, you know, it's obviously easy to defect something in another matter. Right. We just didn't right. want to address just one situation. Right. Any other questions for Robert? I think, I think we need to also consider, and again, we can talk about this um, prior to the next hearing. When we when we articulate a right in statute that oral testimony be provided at a public hearing that that currently includes um, decision making decision making only hearings where it's you you're the public is basically a spectator so um, it's something for us to weigh uh, in terms of making recommendations in this bill and in, in potential uh, other drafts of house rules and senate rules So there was, it wasn't a formal motion, but perhaps we have consensus that this bill would be deferred up for additional um, perfections. So I think, um, again, uh, the things that I would propose to add, and I, I would invite anybody else to opine um, before next meeting, or preferably now if you can, 
is that Gary Hooser specifically asked for recognition of the constitutional provision. I think we include direct quotation from that constitutional provision and include it in here. There's no harm to that. I just, again, maybe my hesitation to doing it previously is this opportunity to weaken the language of that provision statutorily, and that could be used to <coughs> interpret the Constitution, but again, I think maybe, you know, it's a good symbol, and sometimes symbols are important, so we can certainly include that in here. Um, perhaps try to include language specifically um, uh, trying to articulate the decision-making discussion. So again, if a bill is going to be deferred, actually requiring the chair to define why it's being uh, deferred with specificity. Um, then finally, asking on bill drafts. So that'd be inclusion of three additional uh, rights um, in, in this draft and uh, any other uh, suggestions that others might have or amendments others might have. Okay, I'm not quite sure what you're um, recommending or anticipating with the inclusion of the constitutional provision for <coughs> discussion of um, all the bills decision -making. In, in public. Decision making um, in public. Yeah. So, uh, to, to be clear, I am suggesting we defer and that these three amendments would be made before it came back to us. Um, one of the things that we received a testimony on uh, was a ask that um, either a House Senate rule change or a bill would be proposed to ensure that Hawaii State Constitution Article 3, Section 12, which states every meeting of a committee in either House or of a committee comprised of a member or members of both houses held for the purpose of making a decision on matters referred to the committee shall be open to the public. And so I think the attempt would be is essentially to incorporate that language as one of the rights. Um, again, I am, I am ambivalent on whether or not that's necessary or not because it's already in the Constitution. But if, you know, <coughs> I, I think there's been some discourse about maybe needing to do something more and I, I'm happy to include it at least for discussion purposes. Okay. Um. I'm sort of troubled with that approach. Certainly, it's very important. I'm wondering if it could be included perhaps in the preamble to the bill. I'm just not very confident um, that having it as a rule is going to make any difference whatsoever. It is one of the most important things we should call out in our report, but. Um, that's my reaction, and we can wait until next time if, since we're going to discuss it more, but I'm letting you know I, I think, unfortunately, this is probably going to be resolved through litigation at some point. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that input. <coughs> if you don't mind me being so bold, is there any other suggestions for the uh, inclusion into what's in here? Presumably, if we think of something between now and in the next meeting, we could let you know. Sure. Okay. Thank you. All right. So I believe that um, the tenth measure we were considering, there's a consensus that that would be deferred until our next meeting. Item five on our agenda, we were planning to consider a draft bill from a previous meeting concerning recording public meetings. Uh, Nikos, do you we have an update? We don't have a, a working draft that reflects, adequately reflects the, the input of okay. Commissioner Harris okay. and myself. Yeah, All right, so. then this will be deferred into, until our next meeting. Other matters. Uh, Kristen is not here. I'm trying to remember um, what she was reporting to us about when she might be ready to um, offer up the public financing bill. I thought she said December, but that can't be because no. our report is due in December. But um, we have, I'm just pointing out that we have several important um, matters that we haven't, uh, we haven't arrived at a meeting date for. I do know that um, Flo, on November 9th, you, are we still planning to have your report on prosecution of corruption? On the 9th, right? Yes. yes. Okay. 
previously, um, Chair Foley had asked us to hold November 2nd free uh, for discussion of unresolved matters. Um, and um, before we started today's discussion, I was thinking that that included um, additional rule changes. Um, I guess my question is, do we need to meet on November 2nd? That's only a week away. Will, will we be ready to meet then, or are we better off uh, trying to handle uh, the changes to uh, the deferred bill on public meetings, the deferred bill on uh, public rights, and the deferred bill on funding for grants and aid? We have at least three deferred bills. Uh, so we would be trying to do that on the 9th, in addition to Flo's plans for um, the prosecution bills. And how many bills are you anticipating, Flo? Three to five. Oh, okay. What, why, don't, why don't just, I know it's an inconvenience, but why don't we try to um, hold the meeting on the second to address those three deferred bills just to try yeah. to get them yeah. to work through. Yeah. Um, I think public financing of elections and the criminal matters that Flo are gonna bring up deserve as much time as we can mm -hmm. give to them. Yes, and um, we might have a resolution or a bill on um, super PACs. So um, Casey's still working on it, so uh, if it's ready, uh, we might address it on November 2nd. All right, so on November 2nd, we, we now have four agenda items, is that correct? Uh, possible super PAC bill, um, the recordings of public meetings bill, the uh, funding for grants and aid for the county ethics boards, and the uh, public rights for conduct of the legislators. And any additional rule changes? That, yes, I would say that deserves a meeting of its yeah. own. That's a lot of work. So that's the plan for November 2nd. November 9th, we'll stick with our plan to have um, Flo present the um, prosecution measures. Is that when Kristen is presenting as well? Yes, that's when Kristen is presenting as well. That would be the grand finale <laughs> of, of uh, new ideas. Looking forward to that. All right, any other business? Oh, I, thank you very much. Robert, I, do you have something? I, I will handle the drafting of the agenda um, for purposes of Friday. Okay. Um, and I guess for the public listening in, just because of the timing, it's possible some of the drafts of bills may slip until Monday or closer to the meeting, just recognizing we only have a week to okay. get some of this done. So okay. please bear with us. But the goal would be to um, have everything ready by Friday. Yeah, the goal would be, but obviously, uh, for example, yeah. the super PAC bill and others right. just may not be ready right. by that point. Right. Okay. 